All right, good morning. And uh, we'll, we'll spend the rest of the day together. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, trauma and then aortic valve disease, uh, mostly AS, but also AR, mostly surgical, but also TAVR. And then, uh, and then we'll do some congenital sessions in the afternoon. So. Well, uh, you'll, you'll take the test in a couple of weeks, right, in December? Yeah, so, so you still have a little bit of time to review things. I mean, uh, I think the Oslo course is a good background. I've been doing it for a number of years, like since 2005, maybe even. Uh, so, um, you know, it's a, it's a good, good uh, overall review. You just want to do, obviously, a lot, you know, re reading on your own. You cannot rely only on this, but, uh, but this will give you the highlights. So let's talk about uh, cardiothoracic trauma. Uh, we'll uh, we'll sort of start talking about coronary artery injuries because those are those are some of the more uh, common uh, injuries. But but the ventricular injuries are probably the most common. The uh, coronary artery injuries, the LAD being sort of in the anterior part of the uh, of the of the chest and mediastinum, is the most commonly injured in both blunt and penetrating trauma. The um, the right, since it's also more anterior, is also injured second most, and then, and then the circumflex, since it's posterior, is less, less commonly injured. And uh, the, you also have some lung protection for the circumflex. Uh, the uh, distal injuries, if it's small, you can sort of consider ligating it. Uh, you will have a small infarction, and the question is what, is what is too small and what is too big. But that's a judgment call. Um, there are no trials, there's no studies, you know, randomized things, or it, it, a lot of it is just uh, Case, case reports, um, whereas proximal injuries need to be you know, bypassed uh, or, or in the more common era as well, you could consider stenting maybe for a blunt, blunt trauma in the setting of a dissection, uh, which is not that common. But If you look at uh, aneurysms of the ventricle, the, a, tr a true ventricular aneurysm, meaning the whole wall is dilated, that's very rare because more often you have pseudo aneurysms, meaning you have a, a, a cut and then that cut heals and then you have a weakening and then it, uh, it opens up. Um, the, uh, you know, usually the injury in this case is not because of a coronary issue but because of a ventricular issue. So the injury is to the myocardium, not to the coronary arteries, and then, and then, um, uh, and then you can develop the uh, the uh, aneurysms, uh, ventricular aneurysms. Uh, pseudo aneurysms, uh, you know, are, are um, you know, uh, th that would be sort of more of a pseudo aneurysm in this case because it's a myocardial injury, it's a, trans it's a, it's a cut, and then uh, it balloons out. Uh, if, it's a, if it's an injury secondary to a coronary injury, then you can get true ventricular aneurysms, but that's really not very common uh, in the setting of trauma. Septal defects, uh, and here we're talking about ventricular septal defects. Atrial septal defects are almost unheard of in the setting of trauma. But here we're talking about ventricular septal defects. Um, the, um, they're located anywhere sort of in the muscular septum close to the apex. They're, sort of, they're not in the basal part of the heart. They're more in the apical part of the heart. And uh, you can diagnose this as you would diagnose probably uh, uh, post-MI VSD similar pathophysiology. It's a sudden onset of a volume load on the, on the uh, ventricular mass. So you get sudden heart, acute heart failure. And um, it just depends how big that traumatic uh, VST is. Uh, you can see it from blunt trauma. Uh, you can see it from penetrating trauma. Uh, a lot of the penetrating trauma patients will not survive, so some of that is is, is irrelevant for clinical purposes, but, um, but the blunt trauma patients, some of them will survive, so the, um, with, with, with these septal defects. Um, you have a new systolic murmur. It's a, it's a holosystolic murmur, just like a holosystolic murmur for a congenital ventricular septal defect or a post-MIVSD. And you have heart failure because it's a sudden increase of volume load. If it's a gradual increase over time, as you do in the in the sort of a small or medium size VST, that is not as significant. But if you have a sudden increase, just like if you have sudden acute myocardial re um, um, mitral regurgitation from a papillary muscle rupture, that gives, a, that gives you a lot more heart failure than if it's a chronic process that you know, are usually asymptomatic for a long period of time. 
So um, even though they're both severe, so even you know the size by itself isn't the only thing. It's just the sudden onset, the temporal relationship. Uh, the heart hasn't had a chance to accommodate this volume load, and as a result, it uh, you get into uh, heart failure. The um, the diagnosis is by echo with with all the intracardiac uh, patients. I mean, all these patients will get an echo if you suspect an injury, right? I mean, so if you if you look at uh, if you look at trauma, most of this would be in the setting of blunt trauma, where you have to exclude the myocardial contusion and so on. And and usually in that setting, the guidelines are EKG and a troponin. If both of those are normal, then you're done. You know, the likelihood of blunt trauma causing myocardial, any kind of cardiac injury, blunt cardiac injury is as close to zero. Is as close to zero as you, it's almost 100% uh, certainty that you do not have a, from blunt trauma. And because um, the troponin is actually more sensitive than the CKMB and we don't use the CKMB as much anymore. And, and so the combination of an EKG, and by EKG, if there's any abnormality on the EKG, like ST segment changes and so on, you have to compare it to an old EKG if that's available. But, but we're talking about a normal EKG and a normal troponin that excludes blunt cardiac injury of any kind. Um, so if we're looking at these ventricular septal defects, there's, it's an injury to the muscle, the troponin's gonna go up. Any, even when you do heart surgery, right? I mean, you guys have taken care of post-op cardiac patients. When you measure the troponin and, 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 the, and sometimes uh, CKMBs, those are always elevated after, after any kind of cardiac operation, right? So even an ASD, because you, again, you're cutting through the muscle that those enzymes will leak into the bloodstream. And um, so anytime you, so you have an injury like this, you cut into the muscle of the ventricle, then, then you will, um, then you will uh, injure the myocardium and then you'll have an enzyme, an enzyme release. Now, we will have an oxygen step up because as with any VSD, again, congenital, post-MI, traumatic, you will have this step up, this QPQS or this pulmonary blood flow to systemic blood flow. And um, you can measure it with just with doing a right heart cat or a swan. And you get the RA sat, you get the PA sat. And that's really all you need because you can assume the rest of those parameters. And we'll go over that in the congenital part more. But it's a step up of 20 millimeters of mercury or greater that would be consistent with a significant VSD. Or a true PA saturation of 80% or greater, an absolute sat of 80%. And again, this is saturation, not PaO2. Right, so you get the gases, but you, all you care about is the saturation. And from the saturations, you can measure the QPQS. And again, we'll talk about that later. Uh, but uh, the QPQS of, of two to one, means two cardiac outputs to the lungs, one cardiac output to the systemic circulation is significant. 1.5 to one and greater actually is, is, is significant, but two to one is, is for sure significant. And usually we repair at 1.5 to one or greater. You can close, now, these, you know, how do you repair these? I mean, it's a, it, again, it, there's no trials, there's no studies. It's all anecdotal experiences. Since it's all muscular, most of these are in the apex, you apply the same principles for a muscular apical VSD. In the MI setting, it's different because that tissue is, is, is gelatinous. Here, the tissue actually is good because there's no myocardial infarction, or at least we, most of these are, are just an injury just to the muscle, not to the coronary artery and to the muscle, like you have in the post-infarct uh, VSD. So, uh, so you can close these percutaneously, you can close these perventricularly, you can close these surgically. And percutaneously is probably the more common approach, uh, if it's feasible, I mean, that'd be the first thing. And then if it's not possible, then you have two options. You can do perventricular, meaning do a sternotomy or some kind of limited access, but usually a sternotomy. And then, and then you can go through the myocardium with transesophageal and, and angiographic guidance and put a catheter into the LV through the wall, per string, like you do for a transapical um, valve uh, implantation. And then, and then you just thread the device by TE and angiograph. So that's perventricular, not very commonly done, and then and only in specialized centers. And then the other option is, is open. And with open repair, those are most often an apical ventriculotomy. If you can, because again, those are apical. It all depends how, if you can approach it through the tricuspid valve, then you, then you do it through the atrium. But most of these will be apical ventriculotomies. Now, which side? 
you know, the apical right ventriculotomies have probably less of a hemodynamic consequence long term, but it's also harder to close from the right side because you have all these trabeculae on the right in the, in the RV. Apical left ventriculotomy, obviously, you have to avoid the, the LED, but, but if it's a small ventriculotomy, you can, you can probably get to it. So most of these, it depends, again, on the experience. Those are rare in any event. So. So, um, so again, the shunt, if the QPQS, the, that you know, pulmonary to systemic shunt or QPQS is less than 1.5 to 1, then, then you just watch it. But it's 1.5 to 1 or greater, it's an uh, indication for, for closure. Now, not necessarily for surgical closure, but for closure. The, um, an intraaortic balloon pump will help decrease the shunt, will help sta stabilize the patient, as you would in a setting of, say, a post-infarct VST, uh, an acute papillary muscle rupture, uh, the, uh, and the reason for that, at least also in this setting and in the, in the post MI VST, is because you, you, um, you, you're dropping your systemic blood, blood pressure or syst uh, with, with the, when the balloon deflates. So you, have, you shunt you know, a little bit more, at least, uh, uh, blood into the systemic circulation, less into the pulmonary circulation, so it helps decrease the shunt, uh, at least uh, that way. All right, aortic valve injury. The aortic valve is the most commonly injured valve. Um, and uh, again, that's par partly because of where it is located in the heart. Uh, and, um, but also, it's also because of different mechanisms. You have blunt and you have penetrating. So if you look at, um, and we'll talk, I think, about that here in a second. Uh, but if you look at, the mechanism, a lot of it is avulsion of the commissure, say in the setting of, of, uh, of a traumatic dissection. The dissection progresses retrograde, and, and those commissures um, uh, are, are, uh, are now uh, evulsed. Uh, the, um, you can, and the most common injury here is, is regurgitation, right? You cannot, I mean, it's hard to develop stenosis in this setting. It's, it's, a, it's a regurgitation injury. So uh, you'd, you, the repair would be similar to how we would approach aortic dissection. You have to make a judgment call. Is this valve good enough to preserve, or, or do you have to replace it? Um, and you really do not want to do it again. You just want to do it one time. So, so, uh, so you have to make it. So if it's easy to resuspend, then, then you'd resuspend. Um, if, uh, but you need to get a feel of how, how likely that will be. And if the leaflets themselves are injured, I mean, again, again that, a lot of these principles are, are the same principles you use for everything else in heart surgery. So if the leaflets are injured, it's, you're not going to be able to do a valve sparing aortic root replacement, right? You're going to have to do a bental, a mechanical you know, or bioprosthetic uh, root replacement. So same thing here. So if the leaflets are injured, then, then you really have to replace the leaflets. And you know, we're, we're not going to sort of talk about the Ozaki procedure or things like that that are, you know, esoteric at this point, although there's probably promise for it at some point. But here we're just talking about replacement. Right? And for the boards, oral and written, do the safe thing. Do the thing that's been proven time and time again. Don't do sort of esoteric things that, that are maybe done in a setting of a small clinical trial or, or some surgeon's or some center's interest in that procedure, but do something that's accepted overall because they want the main thing is they, they, they want you to be a safe surgeon and by a safe surgeon it doesn't mean that you should do some very fancy things in early on and early on is, is the boards as well right so so um, so I, and 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 like we talk about for a true aortic dissection in the setting of a of non 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 uh, no trauma the same thing same principles apply here because again there are no we just take those principles and apply them here so so um, so if, there, if there's a valve leaflet injury, or if you think you cannot resuspend those valves, leaflets, then, then you just need to do a composite root replacement. Is that clear? Yeah. All right, so the mitral valve, it's, it's, very uh, it's, it's not very common to injure the mitral valve from either blunt or penetrating trauma. Uh, the echo, again, would be diagnostic for all these, all these valvular injuries. Um, and, uh, and again, going back to the blunt trauma, you do not really need an echo to, to exclude blunt trauma. If again, if the troponin and the EKG are okay, then you're done. But if, if you have something else, then, then yes, for sure, an echo is a non-invasive procedure and it's probably overused, but, but it's okay. I mean, we overuse EKGs in, in 
20 year olds who come to the ER with chest pain, right? I mean, everybody, any, most of these will get an EKG, even though the likely 